By the 7th century BC, Assyria had been fighting the Babylonians for centuries. Peace was always temporary and war inevitable. Amongst the strife, however, the Assyrian king Esarhaddon successfully created a manageable harmony between the two powers. Coexistence appeared possible for the first time since Assyria had become overlord. Once Esarhaddon died, he left the rulership of Assyria and Babylonia to his sons Ashurbanipal and Shamashumaukin, respectively. Though this was a period of flourishing in other respects, the legacy Esarhaddon left with Babylon was deeply mismanaged by his successors. Attention to the social concerns of both peoples was dismissed, and Assyria ultimately failed to maintain control of its southern holdings. Assyria's successful relationship with Babylonia was ruined through the injudicious oversight and overt reversal of Esarhaddon's political and religious policies by his sons. The complex relationship between Assyria and Babylon became troubled by Assyrian dominance. They had both been in a cross-cultural exchange since the third millennium, only periodically involving themselves in each other's politics. Assyria borrowed heavily from the Babylonians and respected them as predecessors of many of their skills and customs. During the second millennium, they respectfully held diplomatic exchanges and trading relations. Only under the reign of Tiglath-Pileser III had one become firmly subjected to the other. A previously respectful relationship became muddled with conflict. Further complicating the situation was the societal makeup of Babylonia, which consisted of many different tribes and people groups with varying interests. Historically speaking, the two lands had been peers, but the rise of Assyrian imperial ambitions threatened the deeply rooted traditions and identity of the Babylonian people. Rulership of the Babylonian people did not require a native king, but rather a commitment to their ideology. The ruler was the most important tool for properly managing Babylon. As the enactor of the chief god Marduk's will on earth, his role was that of a mediator between god and man. However, this role was never tied explicitly to a Babylonian nationality. Fulfilling religious and social obligations legitimized the rule of the king. The Near Eastern scholar Shana Zaya says that a certain cultural fluency and ability and desire to assimilate fully into the established royal conventions was necessary for one to act as the proper Babylonian king, and a native Babylonian may simply have had an easier time of it. Even native Babylonians, Bel Ibni, had been rejected in recent memory. The Babylonian people, already loosely united as they were, stressed the ideology of a king over his setting in a dynasty of native blood. Hence, it was possible an Assyrian could reign as king of Babylon if he employed the right strategies. A good Babylonian king needed to fulfill specific cultural and religious obligations, but being a king of Assyria and Babylon added a layer of complexity. For the Lord of Babylon, participation in the annual Akitu, or New Year's festival, paying respect to and managing the cults of the Babylonian gods, and using traditional titulary and inscription formulation were not optional. These demands were easily met with the proper attention without abandoning one's gods in favor of Marduk and his cohorts. However, for an Assyrian king to balance this obligation with the ones to the Assyrian gods and traditions was a more difficult task. This might be why the Assyrian king often appointed a vassal to manage Babylon. Playing two parts was never easy. The Assyrian kings of the 7th century alternated between installing vassals and direct control, paired with appeasement strategies. Some efforts were more helpful than others, but no cohesive plan was developed until Esarhaddon. Some only know Esarhaddon for his erratic behavior but his policies in Babylonia were a flourish of brilliance in an age of madness. He created a successful program by borrowing from the ideas of his predecessors to fashion a series of religious and political initiatives directed at the people of Babylon and its surrounding cities. This included a two-pronged approach to accomplish religious and political goals, a generous construction program, and an ideological campaign through royal inscriptions. 
Esarhaddon's predecessor and father, Sennacherib, had previously destroyed Babylon out of rage, but now Esarhaddon had a chance to cast the Assyrians in a positive light by building a new relationship from the ground up. He entered Babylon as a benevolent king, willing to help rebuild and restore the brokenness that his father had left, forging a legacy of restoration and unity. Construction work on the broken city of Babylon began shortly after Esarhaddon ascended the throne, starting with the all-important Esagila, the home of Babylon's chief god Marduk. His statue had been hauled off in the chaos of destruction, and his house was devastated. Esarhaddon had to provide for the most important religious site to restore the soul of the Babylonian people. In a dramatically formal preparation ceremony, the foundations of the original temple were excavated, anointing rituals carried out, and the gods were invoked for every step. The foundation inscriptions left by Esarhaddon describe the laying of the Esagila's sacred base. In a favorable month, on a propitious day, I laid its foundation upon the former foundations, not leaving out a single yard, not adding even half a yard following its original plans. The clear focus of Esarhaddon's construction programs was the restoration of the Esagila, as it should have been. Nothing was more important than reinstating the king of the land, the giver of their identity, and the lord of life. Tending to Marduk was the ultimate signal of goodwill to the Babylonians. With equal vigor, king pursued a set of reforms targeting the intellectual religious climate at home and abroad. He used royal inscriptions to frame himself as the king of both Assyria and Babylonia and unite them under one banner. If both peoples could view him this way, no one would be lord over the other. A united notion of kingship would help bind these identities into one. In addition, Esarhaddon sought to combine the two people religiously by exploiting their syncretistic tendencies. Marduk was reborn in the Assyrian capital of Asher as part of the official Assyrian pantheon, a son of the god Asher. More than ever before, the Assyrians had warrant to revere Marduk and the Babylonians to revere Asher. Now that their chief deities were connected familially, the exchange and honoring of each other's customs would appear more permissible before the gods and the nations. 669 BC Esarhaddon succumbed to a chronic illness on his way to Egypt. His son, Ashurbanipal, inherited the Assyrian throne, and Shamashumaukin the Babylonian one. This new power dynamic set the stage for the collapse of Assyrian-Babylonian relations. By separating the rule of the land between two kings, propaganda now relied on an underdeveloped image of cultural unity. The king was the linchpin of Esarhaddon's policies, so it is hard to rationalize his decision to unpin this victory. The two brothers assumed a hierarchical relationship. Ashurbanipal was the superior brother, while Shamashumaukin represented the now lesser interests of the Babylonian people. The situation was ripe for discontent. For now, we will leave the story of Esarhaddon and his sons here. But stay tuned for my next video, where I will cover the brutal civil war between Ashurbanipal and Shamashumaukin, and the final collapse of Assyrian-Babylonian relations. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to like and subscribe, and let me know what I should cover next in the comments.